The Desire of Ages, Chapter 26, at Capernaum. At Capernaum, Jesus dwelt in the intervals of his journeys to and fro, and it came to be known as his own city. It was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and near the borders of the beautiful plain of Gennesaret, if not actually upon it. The deep depression of the lake gives to the plain that skirts its shores the genial climate of the south. Here in the days of Christ flourished the palm tree and the olive. Here were orchards and vineyards, green fields and brightly blooming flowers in rich luxuriance, all watered by living streams bursting from the cliffs. The shores of the lake and the hills that at a little distance encircle it were dotted with towns and villages. The lake was covered with fishing boats. Everywhere there was the stir of busy, active life. Capernaum itself was well adapted to be the center of the Savior's work, being on the highway from Damascus to Jerusalem and Egypt and to the Mediterranean Sea. It was a great thoroughfare of travel. People from many lands passed through the city or tarried for rest in their journeyings to and fro. Here Jesus could meet all nations and all ranks, the rich and great, as well as the poor and lowly. And his lessons would be carried to other countries and to many households. Investigation of the prophecies would thus be excited, attention would be directed to the Saviour, and his mission would be brought before the world. Notwithstanding the action of the Sanhedrin against Jesus, the people eagerly awaited the development of his mission. All heaven was astir with interest. Angels were preparing the way for his ministry, moving upon men's hearts and drawing them to the Saviour. In Capernaum, the nobleman's son, whom Christ had healed, was a witness to his power, and the court official and his household joyfully testified of their faith. When it was known that the teacher himself was among them, the whole city was aroused. Multitudes flocked to his presence. On the Sabbath, the people crowded the synagogue until great numbers had to turn away, unable to find entrance. All who heard the Savior were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The teaching of the scribes and elders was cold and formal like a lesson learned by rote. To them, the word of God possessed no vital power. Their own ideas and traditions were substituted for its teaching. In the accustomed round of service, they professed to explain the law, but no inspiration from God stirred their own hearts or the hearts of their hearers. Jesus had nothing to do with the various subjects of dissension among the Jews. It was his work to present the truth his words shed a flood of light upon the teachings of patriarchs and prophets, and the scriptures came to men as a new revelation. Never before had his hearers perceived such a depth of meaning in the word of God. Jesus met the people on their own ground, as one who was acquainted with their perplexities. He made truth beautiful by presenting it in the most direct and simple way. His language was pure, refined and clear as a running stream. His voice was as music to those who had listened to the monotonous tones of the rabbis. But while his teaching was simple, he spoke as one having authority. This characteristic set his teaching in contrast with that of all others. The rabbis spoke with doubt and hesitancy as if the scriptures might be interpreted to mean one thing or exactly the opposite. The hearers were daily involved in greater uncertainty, but Jesus taught the scriptures as of unquestionable authority. Whatever his subject, it was presented with power, as if his words could not be controverted. Yet he was earnest rather than vehement. He spoke as one who had a definite purpose to fulfill. He was bringing to view the realities of the eternal world. In every theme, God was revealed. Jesus sought to break the spell of infatuation which keeps men absorbed in earthly things. 
He placed the things of this life in their true relation as subordinate to those of eternal interest. But he did not ignore their importance. He taught that heaven and earth are linked together and that a knowledge of divine truth prepares men better to perform the duties of everyday life. He spoke as one familiar with heaven, conscious of his relationship to God, yet recognizing his unity with every member of the human family. His messages of mercy were varied to suit his audience. He knew how to speak a word in season to him that is weary, for grace was poured upon his lips that he might convey to men in the most attractive way the treasures of truth. He had tact to meet the prejudiced minds and surprise them with illustrations that won their attention. Through the imagination, he reached the heart. His illustrations were taken from the things of daily life, and although they were simple, they had in them a wonderful depth of meaning. The birds of the air, the lilies of the field, the seed, the shepherd and the sheep. With these objects, Christ illustrated immortal truth. And ever afterward, when his hearers chanced to see these things of nature, they recalled his words. Christ's illustrations constantly repeated his lessons. Christ never flattered men. He never spoke that which would exalt their fancies and imaginations, nor did he praise them for their clever inventions. But deep, unprejudiced thinkers received his teaching and found that it tested their wisdom. They marveled at the spiritual truth expressed in the simplest language. The most highly educated were charmed with his words, and the uneducated were always profited. He had a message for the illiterate, and he made even the heathen to understand that he had a message for them. His tender compassion fell with a touch of healing upon weary and troubled hearts. Even amid the turbulence of angry enemies, he was surrounded with an atmosphere of peace. The beauty of his countenance, the loveliness of his character, above all, the love expressed in look and tone drew to him all who were not hardened in unbelief. Had it not been for the sweet, sympathetic spirit that shone out in every look and word, he would not have attracted the large congregations that he did. The afflicted ones who came to him felt that he linked his interest with theirs as a faithful and tender friend and they desired to know more of the truths he taught. Heaven was brought near. They longed to abide in his presence, that the comfort of his love might be with them continually. Jesus watched with deep earnestness the changing countenances of his hearers. The faces that expressed interest and pleasure gave him great satisfaction. As the arrows of truth pierced to the soul, breaking through the barriers of selfishness and working contrition and finally gratitude. The Saviour was made glad. When his eyes swept over the throng of listeners and he recognized among them the faces he had before seen, his countenance lighted up with joy. He saw in them hopeful subjects for his kingdom. When the truth, plainly spoken, touched some cherished idol, he marked the change of countenance, the cold, forbidding look, which told that the light was unwelcome. When he saw men refuse the message of peace, his heart was pierced to the very depths. Jesus in the synagogue spoke of the kingdom he had come to establish and of his mission to set free the captives of Satan. He was interrupted by a shriek of terror. A madman rushed forward from among the people, crying out, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. All was now confusion and alarm. The attention of the people was diverted from Christ, and his words were unheeded. 
This was Satan's purpose in leading his victim to the synagogue. But Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. The mind of this wretched sufferer had been darkened by Satan, but in the Saviour's presence a ray of light had pierced the gloom. He was roused to long for freedom from Satan's control, but the demon resisted the power of Christ. When the man tried to appeal to Jesus for help, the evil spirit put words into his mouth and he cried out in an agony of fear. The demoniac partially comprehended that he was in the presence of one who could set him free. But when he tried to come within reach of that mighty hand, another's will held him. Another's words found utterance through him. The conflict between the power of Satan and his own desire for freedom was terrible. He who had conquered Satan in the wilderness of temptation was again brought face to face with his enemy. The demon exerted all his power to retain control of his victim. To lose ground here would be to give Jesus a victory. It seemed that the tortured man must lose his life in the struggle with the foe that had been the ruin of his manhood. But the Saviour spoke with authority and set the captive free. The man who had been possessed stood before the wandering people, happy in the freedom of self-possession. Even the demon had testified to the divine power of the Saviour. The man praised God for his deliverance. The eye that had so lately glared with the fire of insanity now beamed with intelligence and overflowed with grateful tears. The people were dumb with amazement. As soon as they recovered speech, they exclaimed one to another, What is this? A new teaching! With authority he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. The secret cause of the affliction that had made this man a fearful spectacle to his friends and a burden to himself was in his own life. He had been fascinated by the pleasures of sin and had thought to make life a grand carnival. He did not dream of becoming a terror to the world and the reproach of his family. He thought his time could be spent in innocent folly but once in the downward path, his feet rapidly descended. Intemperance and frivolity perverted the noble attributes of his nature, and Satan took absolute control of him. Remorse came too late. When he would have sacrificed wealth and pleasure to regain his lost manhood, he had become helpless in the grasp of the evil one. He had placed himself on the enemy's ground, and Satan had taken possession of all his faculties. The tempter had allured him with many charming presentations, but when once the wretched man was in his power, the fiend became relentless in his cruelty and terrible in his angry visitations. So it will be with all who yield to evil. The fascinating pleasure of their early career ends in the darkness of despair or the madness of a ruined soul. The same spirit that tempted Christ in the wilderness and that possessed the maniac of Capernaum controlled the unbelieving Jews. But with them he assumed an air of piety, seeking to deceive them as to their motives in rejecting the Saviour. Their condition was more hopeless than that of the demoniac, for they felt no need of Christ, and were therefore held fast under the power of Satan. The period of Christ's personal ministry among men was the time of greatest activity for the forces of the kingdom of darkness. For ages, Satan with his evil angels had been seeking to control the bodies and the souls of men, to bring upon them sin and suffering. Then he had charged all this misery upon God. Jesus was revealing to men the character of God. 
He was breaking Satan's power and setting his captives free. New life and love and power from heaven were moving upon the hearts of men, and the prince of evil was aroused to contend for the supremacy of his kingdom. Satan summoned all his forces and at every step contested the work of Christ. So it will be in the great final conflict of the controversy between righteousness and sin. While new life and light and power are descending from on high upon the disciples of Christ, a new life is springing up from beneath and energizing the agencies of Satan. Intensity is taking possession of every earthly element. With a subtlety gained through centuries of conflict, the Prince of Evil works under a disguise. He appears clothed as an angel of light, and multitudes are giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In the days of Christ, the leaders and teachers of Israel were powerless to resist the work of Satan. They were neglecting the only means by which they could have withstood evil spirits. It was by the word of God that Christ overcame the wicked one. The leaders of Israel professed to be the expositors of God's word, but they had studied it only to sustain their traditions and enforce their man-made observances. By their interpretation, they made it express sentiments that God had never given. Their mystical construction made indistinct that which he had made plain. They disputed over insignificant technicalities and practically denied the most essential truths. Thus, infertility was sown broadcast. God's word was robbed of its power and evil spirits worked their will. History is repeating. With the open Bible before them and professing to reverence its teachings, many of the religious leaders of our time are destroying faith in it as the Word of God. They busy themselves with dissecting the Word and set their own opinions above its plainest statements. In their hands, God's Word loses its regenerating power. This is why infidelity runs riot and iniquity is rife. When Satan has undermined faith in the Bible, he directs men to other sources for light and power. Thus he insinuates himself. Those who turn from the plain teaching of Scripture and the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit are inviting the control of demons. Criticism and speculation concerning the Scriptures have opened the way for Spiritism and Theosophy those modernized forms of ancient heathenism, to gain a foothold even in the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. Side by side with the preaching of the gospel, agencies are at work which are but the medium of lying spirits. Many a man tampers with these merely from curiosity, but seeing evidence of the working of a more than human power, he is lured on and on until he is controlled by a will stronger than his own. He cannot escape from its mysterious power. The defenses of the soul are broken down. He has no barrier against sin. When once the restraints of God's word and his spirit are rejected, no man knows to what depths of degradation he may sink. Secret sin or master passion may hold him a captive as helpless as was the demoniac of Capernaum. Yet his condition is not hopeless. The means by which we can overcome the wicked one is that by which Christ overcame, the power of the word. God does not control our minds without our consent. But if we desire to know and to do his will, his promises are ours. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know of the teaching. Through faith in these promises, every man may be delivered from the snares of error and the control of sin. Every man is free to choose what power he will have to rule over him. None have fallen so low, none are so vile, but that they can find deliverance in Christ. The demoniac 
in place of prayer, could utter only the words of Satan. Yet, the heart's unspoken appeal was heard. No cry from a soul in need, though it fail of utterance in words, will be unheeded. Those who will consent to enter into covenant relation with the God of heaven are not left to the power of Satan or to the infirmity of their own nature. They are invited by the Savior. Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. The spirits of darkness will battle for the soul once under their dominion, but angels of God will contend for that soul with prevailing power. The Lord says, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? Thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. While the congregation in the synagogue were still spellbound with awe, Jesus withdrew to the home of Peter for a little rest. But here also a shadow had fallen. The mother of Peter's wife lay sick, stricken with a great fever. Jesus rebuked the disease, and the sufferer arose and ministered to the wants of the Master and his disciples. Tidings of the work of Christ spread rapidly throughout Capernaum. For fear of the rabbis, the people dared not come for healing upon the Sabbath. But no sooner had the sun disappeared below the horizon than there was great commotion. From the homes, the shops, the marketplaces, the inhabitants of the city pressed toward the humble dwelling that sheltered Jesus. The sick were brought upon couches. They came leaning upon staffs or supported by friends. They tottered feebly into the Saviour's presence. Hour after hour they came and went, for none could know whether tomorrow would find the healer still among them. Never before had Capernaum witnessed a day like this. The air was filled with the voice of triumph and the shouts of deliverance. The Saviour was joyful in the joy he had awakened. As he witnessed the sufferings of those who had come to him, his heart was stirred with sympathy, and he rejoiced in his power to restore them to health and happiness. Not until the last sufferer had been relieved did Jesus cease his work. It was far into the night when the multitude departed, and silence settled down upon the home of Simon. The long, exciting day was past, and Jesus sought rest. But while the city was still wrapped in slumber, the Saviour, rising up a great while before day, went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Thus were spent the days in the earthly life of Jesus. He often dismissed his disciples to visit their homes and rest, but he gently resisted their efforts to draw him away from his labours. All day he toiled, teaching the ignorant, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, feeding the multitude, and at the eventide or in the early morning, he went away to the sanctuary of the mountains for communion with his father. Often he passed the entire night in prayer and meditation, returning at daybreak to his work among the people. Early in the morning, Peter and his companions came to Jesus, saying that already the people of Capernaum were seeking him. The disciples had been bitterly disappointed at the reception which Christ had met hitherto. The authorities at Jerusalem were seeking to murder him. Even his own townsmen had tried to take his life. But at Capernaum he was welcomed with joyful enthusiasm and the hopes of the disciples kindled anew. It might be that among the liberty-loving Galileans were to be found the supporters of the new kingdom. But with surprise they heard Christ's words, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. In the excitement which then pervaded Capernaum, there was danger that the object of his mission would be lost sight of. Jesus was not satisfied to attract attention to himself merely as a wonder worker or a healer of physical diseases. He was seeking to draw men to him as their saviour. 
while the people were eager to believe that he had come as a king to establish an earthly reign, he desired to turn their minds away from the earthly to the spiritual. Mere worldly success would interfere with his work, and the wonder of the careless crowd jarred upon his spirit. In his life, no self-assertion mingled. The homage which the world gives to position or wealth or talent was foreign to the Son of Man. None of the means that men employ to win allegiance or command homage did Jesus use. Centuries before his birth it had been prophesied of him, He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the dimly burning flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth. The Pharisees sought distinction by their scrupulous ceremonialism and the ostentation of their worship and charities. They proved their zeal for religion by making it the theme of discussion. Disputes between opposing sects were loud and long, and it was not unusual to hear on the streets the voice of angry controversy from the learned doctors of the law. In marked contrast to all this was the life of Jesus. In that life, no noisy disputation, no ostentatious worship, no act to gain applause was ever witnessed. Christ was hid in God, and God was revealed in the character of his Son. To this revelation, Jesus desired the minds of the people to be directed and their homage to be given. The Son of Righteousness did not burst upon the world in splendor to dazzle the senses with his glory. It is written of Christ, his going forth is prepared as the morning. Quietly and gently, the daylight breaks upon the earth, dispelling the shadow of darkness and waking the world to life. So did the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings.